Hi everybody. <clears throat> In this brief lesson, we will study how electrical charges interact with each other. Principally, we'll look at Coulomb's law um, or Maxwell's first equation. We will study how discrete charges interact with each other as well as a given system interacting with a continuous charge distribution. Our agenda today, um, we will start first by looking at how charges interact. Then we will state both the scalar and the vector forms of Coulomb's law. This is basically a review of what of our last lesson. And we will extend uh, this talk into looking at how several charges interact with each other. This is a very important principle in physics. And uh, in this particular context, we will look at the resultant force experienced by a given charge in the presence of several charges. And lastly, we will do exemplary problems that involve some complex charge distributions. And I require your attention here um, so that you could actually see the steps as to how to employ Coulomb's law as well as the principle of superposition in solving some really nice problems in charges. Now, how do charges interact? Essentially, there are two kinds of charges. You have the positive charge and you have the negative charge. Positive charges repel each other. Negative charges repel each other as well. Now, a positive charge will always be attracted by a negative charge. In the same manner, a negative charge will always be attracted by a positive charge. So, if we have Q1, which is positive, and Q2, which is negative, what we expect is an attraction between the two charges. So, this is, they will attract each other. Now, if we have a positive charge and another positive charge, what we expect is that they will repel each other. So this is repulsion. You have here Q1. This is Q2. This is the force exerted by 2 on 1. And this is the force exerted by 1 on 2. So this is they will repel each other. And similarly, if you have a negative charge, and another negative charge they will repel each other as well so this is basically repulsion this is F21 the force exerted by 2 on 1 and this is the force exerted by 1 on 2 repel this is Q1 and uh, this is Q2 basically when you place a charge in the presence of any other charge, it experiences a force. The nature or the type of force experienced by a charged particle depends on the sign of the charge. Now, unlike charges attract and like charges repel, meaning that a negative charge will be attracted by a positive charge and in turn repelled by another negative charge. So the most important point here that the governing principle that determines how charges interact is unlike charges interact or attract while like charges repel. Consider, let's consider a system of two charges. This is the y axis, this is the x axis. And this is the Z axis. Let's say we have Q1 and uh, another charge here, Q2. And they are of the same sign. Let's assume that this is positive and this is positive. Since both charges are both positively charged, it means that they will repel each other. So Q1 will experience a force due to Q2 will experience a force due to Q1 given by F12 and Q1 will experience a force due to Q2 
this is f21 now let's define the position vector the position vector of q1 let's call this r1 and the position vector of q2 let's call this r2 this means that the position vector directed from q1 to q2 this is r1 2 hence you can clearly see that to move from this is the origin q1 q2 to move from q1 to q2 you could move from o to q1 then from q1 to q2 in other words r1 plus r1 2 will be equal to r2 in other words r1 2 is equal to r2 minus r1 generally r1 is equal to x1 i plus y1 j plus z1 k and the r2 will be equal to x2 i plus y2 j plus z2 k therefore r1 2 will be equal to x2 minus x1 i plus y2 minus y1 j plus z2 minus z1 k this gives you the expression for the position vector directed from q1 to q2 now coulomb's law basically states that The force asserted by 1 on 2 is equal to a constant k, q1, q2, divided by r12 squared, r12 cap. This is the statement of Coulomb's law. Now, similarly, F21 bar will be equal to K Q1 Q2 R21 squared R21 cap. But R21 cap is equal to minus R12 cap. This therefore implies that F12 is equal to negative F21. In other words, the force that Q1 asserts on Q2 is equal but oppositely directed to the force that q1 to the force that q2 asserts on q1 this is just newton's third law of motion and similarly we we know that r12 cap is equal to r12 bar divided by r12 this would therefore imply that f12 will be equal to k q1 q2 divided by r12 cube r12 bar this is an alternative form of coulomb's law of motion 
Now the scalar form can be written as F12 without an arrow. This is just going to be equal to K Q1 Q2 in absolute value sign divided by arrow12 squared. This is the scalar form of Coulomb's law. Now you see that the, the scalar form of Coulomb's law actually just gives us the magnitude of the force asserted by one charge on another, but really doesn't give us the direction of the force. And this, this form is actually easier to deal with compared to the vector form, but in this lesson I am going to actually demonstrate to you how to use both the vector and the scalar form of, new, of, of Coulomb's law of forces. Now the next aspect that we are going to look at will be the principle of superposition and more specifically we will study how different set of charges interact with a particular charge. In other words, we will be able to calculate the resultant force on one charge in the presence of many charges. So to make this make sense, let's consider three charges, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And let's consider another charge here, Q4. Now it is worthwhile for you to remember that the electric force asserted by one charge on another always acts along the line joining the centers of the two charges. Let me say that again. The Coulomb's force between any two charges always acts along the line joining the centers between the two charges. This is because electric forces are central forces. Now, the line joining the centers of Q1 and Q2, that is it. The line joining Q2 and Q4 and uh, Q3, Q4, sorry for my free hand, um, at least you get the idea. So, <clears throat> Q4, the force experienced by Q4 due to Q1 will therefore be directed along this line. This is F14. This will be F34. And this will be F24. So, based on the principle of superposition, the resultant force felt by Q4 is simply the vector sum of the individual forces due to Q1, Q2, and Q3. In other words, F4 will be equal to F14 plus F24 plus F34. This will neatly give us the expression of the resultant force experienced by Q4. We can generally state that the force experienced by the J by the, the J charge is equal to the sum from I equal to one to N of F I J, which is just gonna be equal to the sum from i equal to 1 to n of 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught qi qj rij rij cap. Now this is the general expression of the resultant force 
experienced by one charge in the presence of many charges. Here, the Coulomb's constant K is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Right, let's do an example. Um, the diagram shows a system of three charges at the vertices of an equilateral triangle. We need to determine the resultant force on the charge Q at point P. Now, the very first thing here is let's designate our coordinate system. Let's choose a convenient coordinate system. This is the y axis, and that is the x axis. Let's label this as 1, 2, 3. So this is positive, positive, positive. So the charge Q will experience a repulsive force due to 1 and a repulsive force due to Q. So we will have here, this will be F1, no, yeah, F13. And uh, this will be F23. You can clearly see that the resultant force is acting upwards. This will be F3. So, by the principle of superposition, F3 will be equal to F13 plus F23. Now, we need to calculate F13 as well as F23. This angle right here is theta. We can Divide this, this is the perpendicular bisector, so this here is A divided by 2, and this is A divided by 2. And if you use the Pythagorean theorem, you could calculate this side X. You know that A squared plus, sorry, you know that um, using the Pythagorean theorem, you will have a squared equal to a squared over 4 plus x squared which means that x squared will be equal to a squared divided by a squared divided by 4 which is gonna be 3 over 4 a squared in other words x will be equal to a root 3 divided by 2. That distance from here to here. That would mean that the sine of theta, which is going to be opposite x over hypotenuse, it's going to be a root 3 over 2 divided by a. This takes care of this. This is just going to be root 3 over 2 and the cosine of theta is going to be adjacent which is a over 2 divided by the hypotenuse a so this is just going to be 1 over 2 so we know cosine of theta and uh, the sine of theta so this angle here is theta and this angle here is theta. So F13 can be resolved into two components and F23 can be resolved into two components. So we have 
a scenario like this. This is F13. This is F23. This is theta. This is theta. So we could resolve F13 here. This will be F13 cosine theta. This is F13 sine theta. This is F23 sine theta. And this is F23 cosine theta. So we have F13 bar will be equal to F13 cosine theta i plus F13 sine theta g. Similarly, F23 will be equal to F23 negative F23 cosine theta i plus F23 sine theta j. Now, from the previous slide, we know what sine theta is. Sine theta is root 3 over 2. And cosine theta is just half. But what do we know? We know that F we know that F one three is equal to k q1 q3 divided by r13 squared which will be k q squared divided by r13 r13 is a so this will be a squared. Similarly, F23 is going to be K Q2. Similarly, F23 is going to be equal to K Q2 Q3 divided by R23 squared. This is equal to K Q squared over A squared. Now, remarkably, you can clearly see that the magnitude of F13 is equal to the magnitude of F23. And if that is the case, You can clearly see that F3, which is the sum, this which is Q F13 plus F23, you see that this will cancel out with this, and this will be equal to 2 F13 sine theta j. So F3 will be equal to K Q squared over A squared sine theta is root 3 over 2 J. So this is just going to be equal to root 3 K Q squared all divided by 2 A squared J. Newtons. 
So this is the resultant force experienced by Q3 in the presence of Q1 and Q2. Now the next example involves a system of four charges. In this case, we have four charges Let's label the charges as one, two. Now let me do it the other way around. Let's label the charges as one, two, three, and the four. And we need to calculate the resultant force experienced by Q, that is charge three. So the very first step is to impose a coordinate system. My coordinate system, this is Y. And that is X. This is A, A, so this is root 2, A. Remember, this is 1, 2, 3, 4. And we want to calculate the charge, the force experienced by Q3. So F3 will be equal to F13 plus F23 plus F33 plus F43. But keep in mind that a charge cannot exert a force on itself. So F33 will be zero. So this means that F3 will just be equal to F13 plus F23 plus F43. This is the principle of superposition for this system. Now, let's look at this. This is positively charged. This is positively charged. And this is positively charged. So let's take the direction in which the forces will act. So F13 will act along the diagonal. This is F13. F23 will act along the x-axis. And the F43 will act along the Y axis. Now let's call this angle theta. You can clearly see that F43 has just one component along the Y axis. F23 has just one component along the X axis. And F13 can be resolved into two components, one along the x-axis and one along the y-axis. Let's call this angle theta. And that would imply that sine theta will be equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is just 1 over root 2 and cosine theta will be equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse which is just 1 over root 2. So this is sine and cosine and this will become very handy especially when we will be looking for the components of 1 and the 
free. So, F13, just the magnitude, is K, Q1, Q3, divided by R13 squared. So this is just K bracket. Q1 is 3Q. So this is 3Q. Q root 2a all squared and that will give us 3k q squared divided by 2a squared f23 will be equal to k q2 q3 divided by r23 squared which this will be equal to k bracket q2 is 2q so this will be 2q q divided by a squared so this is just 2k q squared divided by a squared and uh, this is I F four three is equal to K Q four Q three divided by R four three squared. This is going to be equal to K bracket. Q4 is just 4Q, so this is 4Q, Q, divided by A squared, that will give us 4K, Q squared, all divided by A squared. Now, if you look at the vector diagram, this is 4, 3, 2, 3, and 1, 3. So let's redraw this somewhere here. So you see that we can resolve F13 into two components. So this is F13 cosine theta, F13 sine theta. So F13 will be equal to sine theta is one over root two, which is equal to cosine theta. So this is just gonna be equal to one over root two F one three I plus one over root two F one three G. So um, <clears throat> F3 will be equal to F13 is equal to 3k q squared over 2q squared. F23 is given by this expression. And F43 is given by that expression. So F3, which is equal to F13 plus F23 plus F43, this will be equal to F13 is 1 over root 2 f13 i plus 1 over root 2 f13 j this is just gonna be equal to f23 i plus f43 j 
so we can group all the i components as well as all the j components successfully if we do that we will have f3 all equal to 1 over root 2 f13 the expression is given by 3q 3kq squared 2a squared so this is 3kq squared divided by 2a squared i plus f23 is 2kq squared over a squared plus 1 over root 2 bracket 3kq squared over 2a squared j plus f43 which is 4kq squared over a squared j now we can further simplify this expression in order to determine the resultant force f3 So let's further simplify this expression. So F3 will be equal to, we could factorize out KQA squared. So this will be KQA squared bracket. So you will have here 3 over 2 root 2 plus. 2i plus 3 over 2 root 2 plus 4j newtons this is the force experience by Q3 in the presence of three charges. Now, this may look complicated, but if you follow the principle of superposition systematically, you will be able to get your results without any problem. Now, physics, as I will say, it's more or less like sports. It really doesn't matter how good you are or how retentive your memory is. If you do not practice, you will certainly uh, find yourself in trouble. So my recommendation for you is for you to actually understand this and grapple with it. You need to actually practice by doing a lot of problems. Now the next example that we will look at is really interesting. It actually involves two charged spheres at equilibrium. Now the question says, two small spheres of mass m and ident two small spheres of mass m and identical charge q are suspended from strings of length l that are connected at a common point each ball forms an angle theta with the vertical axis neglecting gravitational attraction between the spheres by what distance x do they move apart when charge 
So we need to calculate the distance x that they move apart when charged. This is really an interesting problem in which we will combine um, Newton's laws of motion as well as Coulomb's law in order to calculate the separation between two systems or between two charges um, at equilibrium. Now, the very first thing we need to do is start the problem by drawing a free body diagram. Now, I'm going to label this as 1 and I'm going to label this as 2. So definitely, 2 experience a force to the right due to 1. So this is F1, 2. And 1 experience a force to the left due to 2. This is F2, 1. Now, there is the gravitational attraction, a weight acting downwards that is m and definitely there is tension along the string this is t this angle is theta that means that this angle is theta because they are alternate angles and alternate angles are equal so if i kind of draw the free body diagram here representing the sphere as a dot we will have here this is f one two this will be mg and that will be t the tension in the string keep in mind that the angle here is theta and in the same light you could clearly see that we can resolve T into two components. You have T cosine theta and you have T sine theta. Now the system is in equilibrium meaning that the sum of forces acting on the system is equal to zero. This can be rewritten as the sum of forces in the x direction is equal to zero and the sum of forces in the y direction will also be equal to zero. So let's look at the forces along the x direction. You will see that the electrostatic force F12 is balanced by the component of the tension on the string T sine theta. Similarly, the weight of the sphere is balanced by the component of tension on the string T cosine theta. So we have the sum of Fy, will, which will be equal to um, <coughs> Taking the upward direction as positive, this will be T cosine theta minus mg equal to zero. This means that T cosine of theta will be equal to mg. Let's call this equation one. Similarly, the summation of Fx will be equal to F12 minus T sine theta equal to zero which implies that t sine theta will be equal to f12 let's call this equation two now equation one implies that t is equal to mg divided by cosine theta so this gives us the tension in the string in terms of given variables mg and theta now, if we substitute this value of t in equation 2, this would mean that mg divided by cosine theta, sine theta will be equal to f12. Now, sine divided by cosine will be equal to tangent, so that can be rewritten as mg sine theta divided by cosine theta which will be equal to F12. 
in other words mg tan theta will be equal to f12 so this gives us the electrostatic force between the charges now what do we know we know that f12 is gonna be equal to k q1 q2 divided by r12 squared this is just gonna be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught multiplied by q squared divided by r squared or better still x squared hence hence q squared over 4 pi epsilon naught x squared will be equal to mg the tangent of theta but what about tan theta if you look at this diagram assuming that theta is small this distance from here to here this will be x divided by 2 this will be x divided by 2 now um, <clears throat> sine theta will be equal to opposite which is x divided by 2 divided by the hypotenuse which is L so technically this is going to be x divided by 2L So for small angles, if theta is small, then sine theta will be approximately equal to tangent of theta, which will be equal to um, x over 2L. Hence, we can see that q squared all divided by 4 pi epsilon naught x squared will be equal to mgx all divided by 2l. We can multiply, simplify this further. Let me rewrite this on the opposite side of the expert of the equation. So we will have here um, mgx over 2l. equal to q squared over 4 pi epsilon naught x squared this means that x cubed if you multiply that will be equal to this is q squared will be equal to q squared divided by 2 pi epsilon naught mg and there's an L up right up right there therefore x will be equal to the cube root of q squared l divided by 2 pi epsilon naught mg and that will give you the expression for x the next example involves two charges 
which are identical one is placed on the positive x-axis and the other is placed on the negative x-axis and we really want to see how this two this system of two charges experiences or asserts how do they interact with another charge along the x-axis so the question goes as follows two identical particles each having charge plus q are fixed in space and are separated by a distance d a third charge negative q is free to move and lies initially at rest on the perpendicular bisector of the two fixed charges a distance x from the midpoint between the two fixed charges now show that if x is small compared to d the motion of negative q will be simple harmonic along the perpendicular bisector joining the two charges and uh, we are required to determine the period of oscillation of the motion now this is quite an interesting problem now we will first of all start by let's level the charges this is one this is two and that is three we see that um, q3 will be attracted to q1 because it's negative so this is f13 and uh, will be attracted to q2 because they are oppositely charged this is f23 evidently the resultant force f3 will be directed along the x axis The distance from here to here is d over 2. The distance from here to here is x, which means that the distance from here to here will be the square root of d square over 4 plus x squared. Similarly, this is d squared over 4 plus x squared. So from the principle of superposition of charges, F3 will be equal to F13 plus F23. Now F13 will be equal to F13 sine theta, sorry, cosine theta I plus F13 sine theta G. You have here F23. This will be equal to F23 This is negative cosine theta i This is negative i minus F23 sine theta j Now you recognize that F23 is equal to F13 which is just gonna be equal to K Q big Q divided by R squared 
where r squared is equal to d squared over 4 plus x squared. Now, since they are equal in magnitude, it means that their y components will cancel and the f3 becomes so f3 will be equal to keep in mind will be equal to negative f13 cosine theta i minus f23 cosine theta i so this is just going to be equal to negative bracket f13 cosine theta plus f23 cosine theta i not j now Cosine theta is equal to, looking at this triangle, cosine theta is adjacent, which is x divided by the hypotenuse, which is all of this. So cosine theta is x divided by the square root of d squared over 4 plus x squared. So this implies that f3 will be equal to negative um, k q bq divided by d squared over 4 plus x squared this is multiplied by 2 all multiplied by x divided by the square root of d squared over 4 plus x squared so um, this would mean that f3 will be equal to negative 2k q small q x divided by d squared over 4 plus x squared raised to the power 3 over 2 i. So this is the expression for the force experienced by the charged particle along the x-axis. Now the question specifically tells us that x is way way smaller than d. This would mean that x squared is approximately equal to zero and if x squared is approximately equal to zero the square root of d squared over 4 is just d over 2 and all of these raised to the power 3 so this is d squared d cubed all divided by 8 so um, <clears throat> f3 becomes 4 small x f3 becomes negative 2 k q q x divided by d cube all divided by 8 i which will be equal to negative 16 k q q all divided by d cube multiplied by x now this is the resultant force acting on a so we know that from newton's second law f is equal to ma this is the net force acting on an object this would mean that ma will be equal to negative 16 kqq divided by d cube or multiply by x in other words the acceleration of the particle is equal to negative 16 k q bq divided by m d q 
cube all multiplied by x. This gives us the expression for the acceleration of the object. Now, when you want to compare this expression with for, for an object performing simple harmonic motion, a is equal to negative omega square x. So comparing this with this, you could clearly see that both accelerations are proportional to the displacement of the object from equilibrium position, but oppositely directed, which is just the definition of an object performing simple harmonic motion. So comparing this and this, you could therefore see that omega squared will be equal to 2k small q big q divided by m d raised to the power 3. But what do we know? Omega is equal to 2 pi divided by t. This therefore means that 2 pi divided by t will be equal to the square root of 2k small q big q divided by md cube. In other words, t will be equal to 2 pi, the square root of md cube divided by 2k small q big q. This is the period of oscillation of the charged particle performing simple harmonic motion about the center.